Well, good morning, Apostles family. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you made it um, to Sunday worship today. If you are new or maybe you've been coming for a little bit and you'd like to get connected to the church or just have questions about some things in our church, what we believe, what we do, what does it mean to be a part of a community in this season, uh, we would love to answer any questions and we'd love to connect with you. So there is a connect box. You can just click on the top of the screen and a form will come up and you can just fill out any information that you're comfortable giving and um, we'll be able to connect with you in that way. Okay, um, today um, we are looking at a, a difficult passage again in the book of Revelation uh, of chapter 14. And um, it's challenging and, and enough to where I, I would encourage you again, I think you should probably do it every week, but just want to encourage you to, again, if you have the ability to have an open Bible or maybe on your phone, just have the app open, um, the passage of Revelation 14, just open in front of you. Just, I think it'd be helpful just to connect dots and, and sort of follow along as we try to unpack this passage together. Um, but I think it'll be worth it, and um, I'm hopeful that the Lord will, will lead us uh, in understanding today. Well, if you feel comfortable enough to stand, um, I want to call you to worship. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. All right, friends, let's sing. Father for his grace by which he's called us. Praise be to the 
Testified when you're clean We must praise the Lord Our shame and fear have lost their hold We must praise the Lord our God Praise be to the Father for His grace By which He's called us of confession, let's hear this invitation from the Lord. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. As we continue to sing, let's turn to the Lord, knowing he is full of mercy and steadfast love.
Jesus, there is waiting patiently for thee. Hear him gently calling, come, oh, come to me, come, oh, come to me. me
Let's read together from 1 John 4. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In this confidence, let's greet each other now in peace. The scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth was no lie found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, 
put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for a thousand six hundred stadia. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are in our sermon series through the book of Revelation and we're in a fairly emotionally difficult passage. I don't know if you picked that up from the reading. Um, Chapter 14 is set in this larger context of chapters 12 through 14, right? So chapters 12 and 13 are about evil. What, what, is, what does God say about evil? And how does the dragon and its beast, how they're, they're working in this world? And uh, chapter 14 is what God is doing about it, his response to evil. Now, the reason why I say this is an emotionally challenging and difficult passage is because it's about the doctrine of, of hell. It's eternal torment and, and judgment. Now, most people around you, your neighbors, your friends at work, your, your family, may not believe in hell, and, and most of us who do are uncomfortable with it. But what's interesting is that more than any other figure in in the Bible, Jesus talks about hell. I mean, in Matthew, he says, don't fear anyone who has just the ability to kill your body, but not the soul. But instead, fear the one who can can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. He, He depicts hell as a painful fire, an outer darkness, a worm that never dies, this sort of misery and unhappiness. He clearly believed that hell was a real place of not just physical misery, but spiritual. Now, if Jesus, the the Lord of love and the author of grace, spoke more about hell, more often and more vividly than anyone else, it must be a critical truth for us. I mean, one of the reasons why I think we have a, a kind of knee-jerk distaste for the doctrine of hell. There's many reasons, but one of them is sort of a, a caricature that it's become of of, of what it really truly is. We have this culturally shaped view of God who's vindictively responding to people who simply don't do what he says. But there's more to it. And, and, and there's more being said here in chapter 14 of Revelation. And I actually think there's actually more comfort to exploring and wrestling with the doctrine of hell than simply pretending like it doesn't exist because we're preaching through the book of Revelation and we can't pretend like it doesn't exist because it's here. It's here in this chapter and it's here elsewhere. So if you remember chapter 13, Revelation 13, the beast or the beast, the two beasts, seem to be in complete sovereign control over the world. They are controlling the systems. They are manipulating and perverting justice. But there's more to the story, says chapter 14. There's more than go- that's going on. John, who enters this scene of the Lamb and the people of God, the 144,000, they're all there. Now, the message of the beast in chapters 13 is the message of idolatry, that you cannot flourish, you cannot live without me. And so you might as well go along. And chapter 14 is different. It's communicating something different. It's contradicting chapter 13 of what the beast says. Now, chapter 14 has these three angelic proclamations. This is the first part of chapter 13. 14. Three angelic proclamations that contradict the message of the beast. 
The first angelic proclamation in chapters, or in verse 6 and 7, is this, this gospel of good news, this message of good news. In verse 7, it says, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him. Now, that may not sound like good news. Well, where's the, the good news? It just says, worship Him or else. The threat of judgment, right? But actually, chapter 14, this first message, this first angelic message, is a message of relief. After reading chapter 13 and all the, the beastly control of the world, there's this first message of relief that the Lamb, the suffering servant, the loving one, the gracious one, the one who's known for being gentle and lowly is the Lord of creation, not the beast. In other words, when we choose to be generous because Christ has been generous to us rather than being consumeristic, it may be costly in this world to do that. It may not seem like a good financial investment, but it's worth the cost because the lamb is sovereign and not the beast. Or when we pursue justice in this world and it's costly, it's worth the cost because the lamb is so sovereign over this creation and not the beast. When we resist sexual immorality, when we, when we pursue chastity, it's worth it because Christ is sovereign, not the beast. In other words, you are free to follow Christ who says to me, I will give you rest rather than the beast who says, never rest or you'll pay for it. So that's the first message of the angel, the first um, angelic message. The second angel comes along and proclaims that the beast actually is overthrown. In verse 8, he says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, remember imagery. Babylon, if you're living in the first century, Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Babylon is imagery for the beast, a great power, a great cultural power that draws people in. It, it, it makes it costly to follow Christ. It uses worship dynamics. Remember last week, the beast uses worship dynamics for idolatry, of greed, of power, of sexual freedom. And what the angel proclaims is that this beast, this Babylon, has fallen. Now, if we look around the world that we live in right now and we consider, it doesn't seem like the beast has fallen. It seems like the beast has actually taken on superpowers. But while it's true that the full defeat of the beast is in the future, the victory of the cross was so definitive that the defeat of the beast can be spoken as if it's in past tense terms. It's so definitive we could say it's already happened. In other words, the substance of the second message of the angel is that the beast is living on borrowed time. Don't keep following him. Turn and follow Christ. Now, the third angel proclaims a warning. This last message is a warning that despite hearing of the beast living on borrowed time, those who continue with the beast, participating and benefiting from the worldly systems without repentance, will experience judgment. Will be drinking of a cup, it says, of God's wrath, of fire and torment. Now, there are two responses to these angelic messages. First, the first response is to actually resist the messages, to, to ignore them, to not follow Christ and just follow the cravings of the heart. And this is where chapter 14 sort of develops the doctrine of hell. And it uses, just like everything else in the book of Revelation, imagery. Imagery to describe the, the nature of hell. He uses the imagery of drinking, harvesting, 
and wine press. Drinking, harvesting, and wine press. Drinking, in verse 18, or I'm sorry, verse 8, um, Babylon, it says Babylon made her followers drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Drink the wine. In other words, drinking is an image of just following the desires of what you want. That's how, that's how Babylon, or that's how the beast draws you in. It, it sort of gives you what you want. It, it causes you to follow the desires of your cravings. Now in verse 10, God's judgment uses the exact same imagery. It's the same imagery of drinking, the drinking from the cup of his wrath. Isn't that interesting? Now, I, I want to connect the dot here. In, in, remember in chapter 9, this is a few weeks ago, very briefly, judgment is explained as God finally just handing you over, giving you what you want, and it destroying you. Now, we, we see this when we live in this world. The, the, the more self-centered, the more self-absorbed, self-pitying, self-justifying people are, the more breakdowns occur relationally, psychologically, even physically. And hell in the Bible is described this way. It's, it's just the trajectory of our lives. The, the Bible teaches us that while the body decays, the soul goes on forever. So if hell is just the trajectory of our lives, imagine the self-destructive outcome of a self-absorbed life going on forever. Of God just handing you over to finally, finally and fully what you want. Hell is simply the freely chosen path of our lives going on forever. J.I. Packer, um, older theologian, he talks about the imagery of, of drinking and, and following what you want. He says, scripture sees hell as self-chosen. Hell appears as God's gesture of respect for human response. All receive what they actually choose, either to be with God forever worshiping Him or without God forever worshiping themselves. Listen, hell, rather than it just being God's vindictive to res response to people who rebel, it's actually handing them over to what they want, dignifying their response to Him. Listen, if the thing you most want is to worship God in the beauty of His holiness, then that is what you will get. If the thing you most want is to be your own master, then that is what you will get. And the problem is that God is life, God is goodness, God is mercy and patience and sweetness and love and beauty. He's the source of all of those things. But when you take away that source of all of those things, we get the exact opposite. We get darkness, we get chaos, we get torment, we get hatred. A life turning in on, it, on it itself completely. And Jesus describes this as a fire, a worm that never dies. But this isn't simply judgment and hell isn't just a passive activity that God just sort of hands you over to what, to what you want. It's also him actively working out justice. In verses 14 through 17, judgment is like the act of harvesting, that, that God is, is actually separating those who have chosen to reject Christ and, just give, and, 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 and separating them from Christ. If you don't want Christ, I will separate you from Christ. If you don't want the, the source of life, I will take you away from the source of light. If you want to be separated from the source of light, I will just give you darkness. And verses 19 and 20, it's like a wine press. Hell is like being crushed in agony. 
Now, the thing about imagery being used to describe hell, the principle of, of understanding imagery um, is, is that the reality that the imagery is pointing to is always greater than the image. And that's true for both the agony of hell and the sweetness of heaven. The images that we try to portray to, to de describe the agony of hell and the sweetness of heaven, they can't cut it quite of giving us a great sense of, of actually what it's like. It's just images. The agony of hell is greater than what we can imagine and give imagery towards. And so is the sweetness of heaven. Now, it's worth pausing for a minute. Maybe the question rises in your mind, why does the agony and terror need to be so great? Why? And I think this is worth pondering, just for a moment, because the answer to that question is, one cannot go halfway. One cannot be halfway miserable apart from Christ. In, in, in the same way, you, you cannot be halfway joyful with Christ. You cannot be halfway miserable apart from Christ. In the same way, you can't be halfway joyful with Christ. It's either absolute joy or absolute misery. With Christ is absolute joy, and apart from Him is absolute terror and absolute misery. Because, listen, the, the call of Christ is that you are free to come to Him. Free to experience mercy and rest and joy and life and abundance. But if you refuse Him, you get the opposite. Now the other response is instead of refusing Christ and following the beasts, it's listening to the messages, the warnings, and following Christ, resisting the beast, living a life of repentance, pursuing endurance with Christ. Now this kind of life has three characteristics. Three characteristics. The first one is devotion. Devotion. Verse 4, it talks about those who are in Christ as those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. They haven't defiled themselves with women. They are virgins. Now, remember, 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 this is imagery. The imagery of virgins and defiling themselves with women is imagery. It's imagery from the prophets when it's talking, because the prophets talk about the nation of Israel as repeatedly calling the nation of Israel a virgin. It does this in 2 Kings and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and the book of Amos. And th this imagery of a virgin is, is, some, is imagery for talking about spiritual devotion. In other words, to, to follow along in the idolatry of the nations was actually called spiritual adultery. That's why in verse 8, when Babylon the Great made the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, it's not talking about fornication or physical sexual impurity. It, it's talking about the spiritual practices and idolatry. It's talking about greed. It's talking about following along in the systems of, of the beast. Christopher Hall says, The devil delights in desensitizing us to the pleasures of this world by attempting to immerse us in it. Did you catch that? The, the devil delights in desensitizing us to, the ple to pleasure by attempting to immerse us in it. While we are enjoying more and more, we're actually, he says, experiencing less and less pleasure. Only Christ can raise our capacity for joy to the highest level of pleasure possible. Virgin imagery is just deep devotion 
in order to find our highest levels of joy and pleasure in Christ. That's what he's getting at. The people who are in Christ are those who will experience this level of joy and pleasure. The second characteristic is resting. Resting. Verse 13 talks about those who are in Christ. He says, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Listen, the beast says, Come to me, and I'll make you worthy. I'll make you great. I'll make you successful, but you have to keep up. You have to never be satisfied. You have to outperform. You have to live up the standards. You, you never can rest. But Christ calls us and says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the only people who, who finally realize that this is the call to the good life are, are the ones who realize that the call of the beast that always perform, never give up, never admit you're wrong, never rest, blow past your limitations, always get yours, never have enough is propaganda to keep us worshiping at the altar of the beast. It's propaganda to keep us worshiping at the altar of the systems of this world. The characteristics of those who are in Christ are those who are resting. And the last characteristic are, are those who sing. We're singing. At the beginning of this passage, you have this image of the Lamb with the 144,000 people, which is, you know, the, the, the figurative number for the people of God. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, um, whenever the people are numbered, they're usually numbered because they're going to war. They need to have a census of how many, how many people that they can get from each tribe of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. There's this many from Benjamin, this many from Judah, this many from Reuben, and you count them all up. And, and this is how many people, hundreds of thousands of, of men, that you can take into battle. And here you have in this passage, chapter 14 of, of Revelation, it's obviously a battle, a battle against the beast and the people of God. Except in this passage, the people of God are not fighting. They're singing. Because Christians are a singing people. Now here, you know why? Here. The biggest reason why the doctrine of hell is important is because it shows us how deeply Christ loves you. The reason why the doctrine of hell is so important is that it shows us how deeply Christ loves us. I think one of the reasons why Jesus talks so vividly about the doctrine of hell in the Gospels is because he wants to ensure that you know that he was willing to experience the deepest, darkest pits of hell for you on the cross. He wants you to know how far he was able to go, how far he did go to show that he loves you. On the cross, he experienced the judgment we deserved. I mean, remember in the garden when he's praying before he goes to the, goes to the cross, he says, Father, if you're able, remove this what, cup from me. Let this cup, this cup of judgment pass from me. He knew what was coming. He knew the, the drinking of the wine of God's wrath, the harvest, the wine press was coming for him. The doctrine of hell, as terrible and troubling as it is, is one of the ways in which we know, in which we can me measure, in which we can sense just how much Christ loves us. I love you so much, I am willing to drink the cup of the wrath of God for you. To experience all the torments of hell for you. And when we know that, when we know how much He loves us, we sing. I don't care if you're a good singer or a bad singer, we sing. Something in us comes out. It makes us into a singing people. Let's pray. 
Father, we ask um, that you would take these troubling passages like Revelation 4 and help us view the world the way you view it. That you're willing to die. You love the world to such an extent you, you gave your life for us. Would that cause us to have soft hearts, not hard, hard, hard hearts? Would that cause us to turn from beastly realities and systems in this world to you? Would it make us new people? And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And through all eternity, 
I will never cease to praise my Redeemer's love for me. Well, let's read this historic confession of faith together. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me fully willing and ready from now on to live for him. Friends, as we sing and as we use this time to worship through giving, let's take heart that whatever may come, we stand in Christ's possession. We're covered by his blood and he's working all things for our good. So let's sing. at the fall, running away when I hear you call, Father, you were at your will. I had no righteousness of my own, I had no right to draw near your throne, but Father, you loved me still, and in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined Adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace
Well, let's pray together. Um, Father, I pray as we leave today, you would grant us grace. Um, we, we need uh, the power of your spirit to lead us, uh, to show us um, the things in our hearts we need to turn from and the resources in you that we need to reach for. So we pray for that mercy as we leave today. And it's the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to head over to the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Um, but before we do, I just have a few announcements. One, we've been mentioning these weeks that we're, we're wanting to hold a, a membership class. And so if you've been attending our church for a while and you're wanting to know what does it mean to be more involved, what does it mean to be a member, we use the language of covenant membership. If you're interested in that, um, I want to encourage you, um, we, we want to uh, do a class. It's probably going to be over Zoom, of course, in this season. So if that's you, there should be a little uh, link in the chat box. You can just click on that and a form will come up and that'll allow us to be able to schedule something that fits into people's needs. So we would love to be able to do that in the coming months. Um, also, uh, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. February 17th, Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is a day in the church calendar that kicks off the season of Lent that leads up to um, Easter. Uh, Ash Wednesday um, sort of um, helps us reflect on our neediness, uh, our frailty, and leading us to consider uh, how maybe we're, we're, we have hardened hearts or areas where we need to be softened in order to lead towards repentance and mercy in Christ. Um, and so this Ash Wednesday, it's going to be different, of course, than previous Ash Wednesdays. Uh, it, it's going to be split up into two parts. We're going to have a morning and evening time. Uh, it's going to be over Zoom. We're going to meet at, at 7 a.m. before we head off to work. Um, and sing some songs, do a, a short devotion. It's going to be a very brief time. And then in the evening um, at 8 p.m., uh, we're actually going to have a time of prayer together. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. It's going to be an important season of Lent for us as a church community. And then uh, related to that, um, Ash Wednesday, we're going to begin right having an evening of prayer. We're going to actually begin to do that every month. So once a month on the third Wednesday of the month, we're going to have a, a prayer service over Zoom for now um, on, a, on the third Wednesday of the night at, at, at probably around 8 p.m. And we're praying that'll be a good rhythm. But also weekly um, at Wednesday, Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. This is weekly now. At, uh, on Wednesday at 7 a.m., we're going to pray together as, as well. We're trying to figure out which prayer rhythms work best for our church community. We did a midday prayer for a long time, and now we feel like we need to switch up and, and sort of hit refresh on our prayer rhythms. So um, the third Wednesday of every a month, we're going to pray in the evening together at 8 p.m., and then once a week on Wednesday morning, we're going to be praying together. And we're going to be praying just for, for our needs of our church, for renewal, for the things that uh, we long to see happen uh, in this season ahead. I think it's going to be important for our church community. All right, friends, uh, you can just push that Zoom link towards the Lord's Supper, and I'll see you over there.